Welcome to today's final session, the political economy dimensions of just transition. My name is Basani Baloyi, Senior Research and Climate Energy and Infrastructure Program Lead at the IEJ. So this is the graveyard session. <laughs> no, but I'm sure the coffee has, has uh, inspired in you um, more um, debate and discussion in this, in this section, uh, session. Uh, this session, we will hear three presentations that situate the country's just transition pathway in varied ways. The paper, A Tale of Life and Death, The Coal Value Chain's Impact on Local Com Communities in South Africa by Lerato Monaisa, Monaisa, accounts empirically for the injustices of the coal value chain and provides recommendations um, for a just transition. Lerato is a researcher at TIPS, and similarly, the paper, A Paradox of Dependence and Effectiveness, A Decolonial Lens to Environmental Justice and Coal Fails Down in, in South Africa by Kolofe Lomueng, a, a researcher, a, a lecturer and PhD candidate at the University of South Africa, shows the paradox of coal dependence uh, for affected, uh, in affected communities and provokes as a recommendation that JT planning should be embodied by decolonial environmental justice. Finally, the paper promoting um, participatory green industrial development, lessons from the Atlanta Special Economic Zones, uh, community stakeholder network, uh, network by Julia Hampton and Michael Webster moves away from the, coal, the focus on coal and explores how justice is taking place in a green technology SEZ in Atlantis through a novel Particip uh, for, through a novel uh, uh, participatory approach. Julia is pursuing a DH Phil at Oxford University and Michael is a community integration officer for the Atlantis Special Economic Zone. Um, so <clears throat> as introduced, my name is Lerato Moneza. I'm an economist at TIPS. And this is a paper that I wrote with um, Gaylo Mons-McClair titled uh, Tale of life and death, the coal value chain's impact on local communities in South Africa. <clears throat> so by way of context, I'm going to introduce the topic and then discuss the coal value chain as a source of economic activity and employment. Um, it's source as a access to infrastructure, the persistent poverty issues that we're seeing um, within Pomalanga and how those will be uh, exacerbated by the, the decline in coal. Um, coal as a, <clears throat> as a source of employment vulnerability and the negative impact it's had on other productive activities, as well as how coal is a source of health impact and social cultural degradation. Much of what I'm going to be discussing, everyone in this room is familiar with, so I'm just going to try to get through it as quickly as I can to make time. So as we all know, this, the coal value chain in South Africa plays a very structural role in the economy. It's core to the production of electricity, petrochemicals, and also other industrial activities rely on um, coal for electricity. With the changing in um, climate and, and, and domestic policies geared more towards uh, low carbon, um, coal will face significant risks, domestic risks, um, is in terms of the RRP 2019, we're going to see that the generation capacity of coal will likely decline from 80% uh, to about 43% in 2030. Um, ESCOM's announced decommissioning plans of all uh, power plants. Sassel's also announced plans to cut its emissions um, by between six and 10% by 2030. And in terms of international risk, we can see from South Africa's leading export markets in terms of coal, India, Pakistan, and South Korea, they're all planning um, to reduce coal imports um, to build their energy resilience, as well as moving towards renewable energy um, within their power mix. And there's also a lot of disinvestment um, locally and, and internationally. And in addition to that, there's um, climate change policies such as the European um, Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which will place South Africa's economy at risk in terms of export market. Um, 
And so the transition away from coal has already begun. And workers and communities where coal is concentrated will be most vulnerable to that transition. And so calls have been made for the transition to be a just transition. Just transition is an inclusive process and outcome that offers social protection and guarantees to workers, communities, and small businesses in industries where um, there, there's going to be a decline due to climate change. And it's rooted in democracy and social dialogue between workers, communities, government, and businesses. And it also aims to ensure minimum disruptions for workers and communities um, that are dependent on unsustainable industries. So when we look at coal as a source of uh, economic activity and employment, the coal value chain runs deep within the South African economy from mining to transport to power generation. And then you have also um, other industrial uh, uh, activities such as aluminum smelting, which relies heavily on coal-based electricity. Um, coal contributes to export revenue. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a primary source of electricity in South Africa. Um, Sassol produces about 25% of our liquid fuel needs. And throughout the value chain, there's about 150,000 people employed, the bulk of which are in coal mining, followed by petrochemical, followed by transportation. And all of this is concentrated in Mpumalanga, particularly in four municipalities, namely Emalasleni, Steve Trete, Govan Mbeki, and Masihulwa. Out of the 13 power stations by ESCOM, 11 of those are located in, in Mpumalanga and Sassel's um, facility is located in, in Sakuna. And as we can see from figure one, the bulk of the value added in, in 2018 in these municipalities was from coal activities. And workers within the coal value chain fare better than others in than other parts of the, of the formal economy. Um, the median income of coal workers is higher than that of formal employment, and workers within the coal value chain have a source of um, social security in terms of um, pensions and other benefits. In terms of access to infrastructure, um, the coal value chain has built up strategic infrastructure to support its activities. The development of this bulk infrastructure has, to some extent, trickled down to, to services at the community level. So an example of the infrastructure being built, it's like roads to transport coal, as well as the Richards Bay Harbor and the Richards Bay Coal Freight Line, which <clears throat> is not only just used by, by coal. And then um, in terms of electricity, the electrification of South African households and water, the building of pipelines and distribution systems, which service power stations and mines. And also in that, the, the key players within the, the Value chain have also assisted in, in providing services to communities. Um, Sassol have created a water sewage and a water treatment works. Anglo-American has worked um, on supporting early childhood development and such. So with the development of coal and, and, and coal activities within the gold field, um, they have not led to improved performance in these municipalities in terms of poverty and inequality. Um, and as the country transitions towards a low carbon economy, the closure of, of, of mines and the restructuring of power stations will have serious impact on the economic activity, employment, as well as government revenues within those municipalities. On the other hand, coal has also displaced other economic activities. Um, agriculture and tourism have been pushed out in certain areas and Within the, within the other um, economic activities in those municipalities, a lot of them are, are used to service the coal value chain and to service the people who work within the value chain. So coal is a source of economic vulnerability in these four municipalities because these four municipalities have remained largely under, un, undiversified and have relied on coal and coal related activities. In um, Mpumalanga, 5% of Mpumalanga's formal employment is coal and coal related, and about 76% of that are, are, is in those four municipalities. So when we look at skills um, of the, the workers within the coal value chain, we can see that um, education levels in coal mining is slightly lower than that of formal workers. 
the majority of coal miners either have a matric or less. And the workforce has specialized training, meaning that it'll be difficult uh, to transfer those skills into, into other industries. On the other hand, coal has also had a, a disruptive effect on other productive activities. The sterilization of soil, um, contamination of water has, has had a serious impact on agricultural activities in the province, as well as the loss of biodiversity and wildlife. It's also had a, a, an impact on the tourism activities in the province. So when we look at um, coal as a source of health impacts and, and social degradation, the issues around health have been discussed at length. Um, when it comes to, to um, the air pollution that residents of those communities experience. Um, and then in terms of land, uh, land and water pollution, um, producing coal, producing electricity from coal is a very water intensive process. Um, and in one second, ESCOM consumes about um, the same amount of water a person consumes in a year. In addition to the large water consumption, there's also acid mine drainage, which contaminates the water, which could have serious impact on the health of residents, uh, wildlife, and, and biodiversity. In addition to that, there's the blasting and noise pollution that's created from coal mining activities. Um, blasting has resulted in hearing losses and increased anxiety from residents. The dust particles um, also is not good for respiratory health of residents, as well as the sinkholes that arise from, from coal blasting. And lastly, historically in South Africa, um, coal mining, mining in general has, dis has uh, dispossessed many indigenous people from their ancestral lands. The relocation of communities to accommodate for mining has led to the desiccation of, of ancestral graves and has largely led to the fragmentation of the social, of the social structure of local communities. Yeah. So in conclusion, um, the planning of the just transition is, is urgent. It, it should have begun yesterday. Um, and while coal has become a, a source of economic activity, and economic development in South Africa, it's also had a disastrous impact on the environment and the communities um, impacted by it, particularly these four municipalities. Um, and these communities have been artificially stuck between need for employment and a need and livelihood, as well as the right to a clean and safe environment. Um, so the Just Transition Agenda offers the opportunity, you know, and effectively commands um, the, us to overcome this, this false dichotomy. So what will it require? First, it will require to acknowledge the starting point. The past and the current situation within the cold fields is highly unjust. Second, it will require the scale of distress created by the transition. It should be internalized by all decision makers. And then third, achieving a just transition requires a marshal of all stakeholders in action. Only collaborative thinking, implementation will garner the necessary financial and um, knowledge resources to establish the conditions for a just transition. And while the just transition journey will be incremental, it should be ushered and it should be ushered urgently. It is important that the actions taken by decision makers make sure that no one is left behind and that remedial action is taken for those who already have. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kulofe Lemoing. The paper that I'm presenting today is actually part of my doctoral thesis on the challenges and opportunities for coal communities in a just transition. Um, we're arguing towards a transition that is underpinned by environmental justice. Um, the study is under the supervision of Dr. Victor Munich of Wurzsop Institute, and it is funded by the National Institute of Humanities and Social Sciences. So the core argument that underpins the study is the fact that coal communities find themselves in a paradoxical position due to the coal phase out that is unfolding through the energy transition. And I think it's safe to say um, the video that was played earlier on about the voices under the cloud 
and also um, Lerato's um, presentation now, it captured the essence of the paradox that this paper is actually focusing on with the contribution of coal, of the coal economy, that is, we know, we very know, uh, we know uh, of it, and equally, we know about the significant impact that coal has had on the environment that has perpetuated over time. So both the, this, this, the, the, the effects on one side and the benefits on another create this dual picture, which, are, which based on this paper is argued on the basis of it presenting this people, the communities, um, what looks like a paradoxical position, and I'll argue it as I go along. The transition um, from coal intensive energy system presents a paradox because we've got environmental sustainability that is that underpins the, the transition on one hand, and we've got the alteration of livelihood on the other. Previous speakers have spoken more on the job losses that will okay because of the just transition and i want to go further to include the livelihoods that are not they're not directly tied that you cannot see the direct connection but they are there and they are very important to these communities because it's not everybody who's necessarily directly benefiting from the coal economy so although environmental sustainability based on what we saw earlier on presents a, a pathway to exit some of this injustices that are entrenched in a coal system, it equally presents losses of jobs and livelihoods for these communities. So this paradoxical stance is, is, is underpinned by the two key features that actually characterize this coal communities, which is the dependence and the affectedness. So when we consider this dependence and the affectedness from what Chambers has termed the deprivation trap, we see trends of powerlessness, vulnerability, and voicelessness. And the powerlessness is facilitated by issues of bread and butter, whereby these communities find themselves in a very uncomfortable um, situation. However, because of the bread and butter issues, it's, 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 it's they find themselves being voiceless. They cannot, they, they're not comfortable enough to voice out the frustrations that the coal economy is actually imposing on them. So instead, they are rendered voiceless because they, they, cannot, they, can, they cannot afford to lose their bread and butter. And, and also suppressing that voice actually perpetuates a whole issue of vulnerability because they remain vulnerable in this sector that is not very conducive to their well-being. And, and it renders them powerless and voiceless and it just perpetuates the whole um, deprivation trap that has been reflected to by Robert Chambers. And then the, the ontological perspective, um, it has been dealt with in detail throughout the day. Um, what I just want to argue on this one, it's how the, the struggles of coal communities are actually multifaceted and they evolve. So they are more than just evolving, they are entrenched in colonial and neo-colonial mechanisms that underprivilege resource wealthy nations. This has been argued by Walter Rutney in his writing about how Europe underdeveloped Africa, where he writes about the role that imperial system has played in retarding Africa's economies. Through the exploitation project, we saw African wealth being drained and systems being manipulated and the capitalist strategies that were used um, to exploit Africa. Ex it expands that and on, on his book that was published in 1973. And then an, a historical analysis of all these dynamics is it's clearly or oh, it's, 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 it's well portrayed through the mineral energy complex where we get to understand the subordinate position of coal to the gold sector, which then resulted in um, the, the, the attraction of cheap labor for, cheap, for, for the production of cheap coal, which as a result redefined the landscape of the Mpumalanga province because then squatter settlements happened as a result, hostels were cramped as a result, which in over and above everything that was happening, it just pr presented a whole new dimension of social injustices that the Mpumalanga province people had to, or the Highfield people had to contend with. So one of the problems that is um, evolving in our society today is the Zamazamas, which is also a as a result of the failing legislation to govern the coal economy, which now we are sitting with a lot of many other things that have been captured by a recent publication 
um, which captures the, the the situation that is happening with regards to the um, the, the 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 transition, uh, especially in the coal dependent um, communities. So the debates around um, the transition and and the dual transit trajectory of South Africa um, is also seen through the greening economy debates and. One of the core questions that underlie these debates is the relevance of the green growth for developing uh, de developing nations like South Africa. Um, as Dekon rightly put it, it's is green growth good for the poor? Because if you look at the Mpumalang economy is replete with poverty and inequalities. And this has also been argued by Babia who has also um, um, raised concerns about the, the relevance of green growth for this kind of communities whereby the pursuit is development and now they have to think about development environment it's 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 just a whole complex dynamics so Swilling has also commented on that on that when he spoke about the the, the, the dual trajectories of developing state at the same line with the sustainability um state okay let me just rush through it and then um, from this paper specifically, I consider the injustices that have been portrayed earlier on through the three E's, which is exclusion, enclosure, and externalities. Exclusion, which captures the essence of um, being excluded by the decision making, which actually affect their well being and their livelihoods. And um, the, the, the enclosure, I'll talk to the enclosure of resources. Lorato spoke about the water that ISCOM uses on a day, which is equivalent to what a household or an individual can use in a year. And lastly, the, the externalities which have been imposed on the, the coal communities. And one of the frameworks that I'm using in my study is Schulbeck's Environmental Justice. I won't go into detail with it. Um, it's a very popular um, framework that is based on capability theory, participatory theory, and recognition theory. And this has been um, evident also in Galo's work um, on his policy primers that actually captured the human element of the just transition, which undergird South Africa's just transition framework. Um, and also this has, as it also links up with the work that Robin and Wright has, have done on the human element of um, the just transition characterized by workers in um, communities, um, consumers, and citizens, which according to him presents a strong interlocking human relation. So one of the arguments that undergird the study is that of considering the whole notion of environmental justice for, uh, from a more decolonial perspective. And I think it is, um, it is safe for me to argue that if you look at Galo's work, it has it captures some of the, the essence that actually the, a decolonial perspective does um, capture. Um, I'm not gonna go through this, um, the, the definition that I've put by Maldonado Dr. Torres, but what is more interesting for me in that definition and how he talks about the long-standing patterns of power that have emerged as, um, as, as a result of colonialism. And one of the key questions that I want to pose to the room is, how do we deduce those powers within the current trajectory of South Africa, the just transition um, trajectory of South Africa? Is it safe to say there are no patterns there or can we say there are patterns here and there? In essence, that a decolonial lens considers the power structures that undergird injustice and how these very structures are epistemolic epistemologically positioned to define the pathway to break from the injustices created. This has been argued by Kachini to say invisible power structures and epistemological designs are guided by the North. So the Europeans imposing on South Africa the transition trajectory that we should, um, we should take. And Alvarez and Cole said have argued um, also towards a more decolonial approach whereby they argue that the epistemic limitation of environment challenges as it is a Latin American perspective, it can actually marginalize certain conceptual formations as a result producing new injustices or perpetuating the ones that are existing on the ground. So it is important to unmask and find alternative ways of reimagining an escape for these injustices and, 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 and consider what constitutes a more decolonial perspective for South Africa. 
a current scholarly emphasis is on it is on the on drawing from African epistemologies and framework and system and approaches that benefit Africans. And um, I'm not going to go through this for the sake of time. But if we listen, if if we remember what was captured in the um, in the video about the voices, there's different positions there and. Those, 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 um, th those people they share their experiences, not just only perspectives, as they're sharing their experiences, philosophies, this community world that needs to be considered. And it's through the decolonial analysis whereby we consider indigenous people and what they perceive as justice for themselves, and also what they define as pathways of breaking out of what has constituted injustice for the longest periods of their lives. And the justice questions, um, um, let me not go through them. How much time do I have left? Okay, okay, I'm not gonna go through the justice questions, but at the core of the justice question is, how do the communities that are affected by these injustices, not us sitting in these rooms, not people sitting in their offices, but how these communities are defining their own injustice. Uh, and and their their own injustice, not how we are imagining it, and how they are uh, how they are perceiving their breakthrough. And in in rethinking the principle of an environmental justice, I want to bring in uh, an important aspect of cognitive justice, which argues and appreciates the diversity and plurality of knowledge, and demands that the different knowledge systems should be acknowledged and be. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a conclusion. Be, uh, they should be recognized and be allowed to, to coexist. And this, in essence, presents um, a shift from this empowerment um, towards participation guided by principles of open dialogue, parliamentary of knowledge, invented and invited spaces for these communities. We cannot just invite them, but we have to allow them to invent their own spaces where they can afford to level up the, the playing field, considering the multi versed nature of the actors involved in the just transition. In conclusion, I just want to, um, okay. In conclusion, the just transition is premised on nobody must be left behind or should be left behind. And similar to phrases like sustainability, um, it has been argued that um, these concepts have become the rigor for politicians and they have been rendered meaningless just be and catch phrases for demagogy. So it is important that we move away from that if we are indeed emerging an alternative economy with a just transition. I thank you all. Hi, good afternoon all. Can you hear me fine? Yes. Great. Sorry I couldn't be there uh, with you today, but hopefully this online presentation will suffice. And before I start, I'd like to introduce my co-author for this paper, who is Michael Webster, who's the Community Integration Officer for the Atlanta Special Economic Zone Company. So I want to thank him for his contributions as he's been around for most of the participatory process that I'm going to talk about. So get to get straight into it. While the just transition calls for green industrialization, the focus is typically on a shift from coal-based sectors, as we've heard today. This leaves out a whole chunk of South Africa's population and economy. For example, there are many areas which have traditionally depended on non-mining manufacturing and industry. These areas are politically and morally significant given South Africa's particular history of apartheid era spatial engineering, which set up many rural and peri-urban homeland areas as industrial nodes. These areas are also in many cases in need of revitalization and indeed a just transition. So thus with this paper, we wanna foreground a critical spatial analytic in this concept of the just transition. So to do that, or part of that will be zooming into the Atlanta Special Economic Zone as a case study, because Atlantis is uh, 40 kilometers from Cape Town and was set up by the apartheid government as an industrial node as part of the government's uh, racist strategy of separate development. Today, part of Atlantis is being transformed into a green technology manufacturing zone, which I'm going to refer to as the ASEZ. And here, the focus is not going to be on the SEZ policy tool itself so much as rather on the program um, for a more spatially just economy and how this specifically might be pursued in a participatory style. 
And this is because participation, we argue, is a necessary dimension of promoting socially equitable green industrialization. And Atlantis is a useful case study for REAP projects, RED uh, projects, and other kind of spatially defined developmental projects and towards green industrialization. So the concept of the just transition uh, intuitively has two broad underpilling philosophical components, which have been made clear today already, but to become environmentally sustainable on the one hand, at the same time to be just, which is socially fair and equitable. More empirically, the concept refers to a shift to sustainable industrialization. At one level, this means creating a growth path, which is labor intensive and provides affordable energy to all. This has been touched on. In particular, the concept of the just transition speaks back to the political economy concept, which explains that South Africa's economy has been structurally centered on a minerals energy complex. This concept implies that South Africa's economy or regime of accumulation has historically been based on the mining of abundant coal and natural resources and the exploitation of cheap black labor to produce cheap energy. From a jobs perspective, as the debate is often looked at, the idea here is that the mining sector has traditionally been a top employer, but is becoming increasingly environmentally unsustainable. So the just transition concept, therefore, typically calls on policy and industry to make sure to absorb those previously employed in mining into greener jobs. However, the issue with this intuitive framing of the just transition as a shift away from mining, hence the word transition, is that it ignores the people today who are already structurally unemployed and often geographically removed from centers of work. This foregrounds a spatial or critical geographic component to the just transition. Critical scholars of the shifts to renewable energy, for example, in South Africa have similarly pointed out that the just transition is not just a set of political or technical shifts or transitions, but also a spatial shift with, for example, land access and land ownership playing a critical role in mediating potential accumulation from natural resources like the sun, which is often framed as a accessible to all resource up in the sky, but often you need land to make energy out of it. Um, so, our case study is the Atlantis Special Economic Zone. Atlantis is a consequence of apartheid state planning. It is a legacy of a past regime that actively worked to set up a spatially unjust economy. According to its racist ideology, the apartheid government initiated its regional industrial development program, which set up 80 what they called growth points in black homelands as part of its industrial decentralization plan. The apartheid government set up these industrial parks offering special incentives and concessions to white manufacturing firms. This industrial decentralization strategy, inherently a spatial strategy, served to showcase the apartheid state's separate development philosophy and action, but it also um, aimed to address more immediate and pragmatic goals like managing urban sprawl in designated white areas. Atlantis was part of this program. It was set up in an area at the time. There was nothing there. It was called near Malmesbury in the plans. In the early plans, they built a township there and moved many so-called colored people there, set up incentives programs, attracted white business, and then canceled the program in the mid-1980s. And since then, the area has witnessed economic decline, experiencing high and increasing unemployment. So it is against this historical spatial backdrop that the post-apartheid government, we argue, and all of us in this conference have a moral and political mandate to think spatially about the just transition. Part of this includes re-industrializing Atlantis and other ex-industrial nodes. In the case of okay, in ex-industrial nodes, um, the next part of the paper, which Michael Webster, my co-author, was uh, very involved in drafting, was the focus of the ASCZ itself which we said was uh, should be seen as a part of the just transition and that it's taking people who are structurally removed from centers of work and training them in green technology. Um, so we say that participation is a very useful lens through which to explore this because you can't have a just so truly socially sensitive just transition without it. Um, because of power dynamics and many of the other issues that have been talked about today. But I'm not going to go into a literature review on participation. I'm going to go straight into kind of empirical, pragmatic contribution to talk a little bit about the ASEZ and its participatory approach. And that's particularly interesting because the law, the SEZ Act, for example, an existing industrial policy, 
um, doesn't kind of mandate this level of community engagement that the Atlanta Special Economic Zone has. The Act, the SEZ Act, stipulates that a community member be represented in any SEZ in the country on the board of directors. But the ASEZ kind of went over and above this. They set up a formal representational body called the Community Stakeholder Network with its own mandate. And this was a response by people in the local community. So briefly, how they... Um, Sorry, I actually I'm running out of time. So they set up the CSN and we kind of want to say that participation is not easily turned into a policy, legal or technocratic issue with easily measurable criteria for success. There's a bunch of critical and kind of normative, more policy specific literature on participation. What we want to do instead is use the ASCZ to shed some light on more questions um, and dimensions of participation in this kind of uh, case where in a structurally removed place where people are desperate for work. So through three key points in summary that the paper aims to shed light on um, is one, it is crucial to align community expectations as far as possible with the realistic project timeline. The idea of the Atlanta Special Economic Zone has been around since 2014. Since then, there have been many public announcements about the oncoming jobs and opportunities. For example, prior even to the zone's designation, representatives of the Depart of the DTIC held a community discussion in Atlantis, wherein community members collectively endorsed the idea and they got on board. Then a while later, President Ramaphosa in December 2018 came and made a public announcement about how the whole community would benefit. And um, while it was taken as an encouraging sign and many community members are getting involved in community processes, they complain that it's destroyed hope because they had expected the opportunities to come a lot sooner than they did um, due to bureaucratic and legal issues with construction only beginning at the beginning of next year. This led to some breakdowns in trust, which leads to the second point, which was trust building needs to be genuine and takes time. It benefits from investments from all project actors and if possible, all three spheres of government. So perhaps as a result of the mismatch between community expectations and the slow project timeline, there was a period when the community stakeholder network and wider community expressed distrust to the project team. They would refuse to engage with them. They only wanted to engage with the DTIC. And the way that this was dealt with, um, which raises the issue of trust building, was DTIC, the city of Cape Town, Western Cape government, the CEO of the Atlanta Special Economic Zone Company, an inter community integration specialist and a trained facilitator were all brought on. They had weekly, if not daily meetings to get to know each other by name, work through issues with the trained and expert facilitator, emphasizing that there is room for um, conflicting ideologies, conflicting visions of the future, but that through negotiation and discussion, they could build trust and build a compromise. So this is the approach that they're currently taking. And lastly, the last point we wanted to make about um, learning from the ASEZ context was that the status of the relationship between the project team and the community structure should be made clear from the outset. In the ASEZ context, there is and has been constant debate about whether the community stakeholder network is or should be on a level of partnership with the company. Um, this has led to debates about the level of capacity training given to the community members, whether they can adequately represent the community, and at the same time, the level of remuneration when people don't have a job and then they're spending money to get to meetings, airtime to send messages and stay in touch. So. That's led to quite a lot of tension. At the moment, the policy which the ASEZ Co has taken, the company has taken, is to provide a stipend to the uh, organization members for data and transport costs, and then giving them their own designated office space in the Atlantis SEZ offices, which sits right next to a dedicated team which works in Atlantis seven days a week with an open door policy focusing on community integration, skills development and enterprise development. So I'm definitely out of time. And in one sentence, our paper aimed to emphasize two under acknowledged dimensions of the just transition, one space and the other one uh, participation. Thanks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks to our presenters. So I just want to um, like open it up a bit. Um, before I, I ask the floor. I think it's Lerado. So your paper, which I found very interesting. In fact, I found all the papers 
uh, very interesting. You speak about, you know, the coal value chain and its impact and, and then what that means for a just transition. And I was just wondering, because there are things that are quite specific, right? And other things that are quite general. There are specific things that we see in the coal value chain and then there are general tendencies that we see um, from infrastructure developments, right? So we know that when we have some kind of mega infrastructure development that in fact, um, there will be competing land uses and agriculture will tend to be um, undermined because of the, you know, the system of accumulation, the political economy that where vested powers sense kind of like in terms of industry tends to be far, tends to win over other sectors, right? And then similarly, there, there are general tendency and, and one can imagine, and I, I think uh, uh, Julia mentioned in her opening uh, statement to say that renew like clean technology renewables can have similar land use competing issues right um, and then you have um, the issue around coal projects and the economic in inequality that that creates um, you know there's something that's quite generalized in mining um, and in other sectors where there's casualization outsourcing all these things are a part of the, the the structure of our economy. So I guess it 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 leaves one to ask, okay, then when we think about a just transition, right, how do we move beyond it, it's there's something more about it than just stakeholders meeting and 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 agreeing to um finance and all that stuff there's something there's a bigger disruption about the structure of the economy that needs to take place and i wonder from your perspective what that will take right uh than the well-intentioned of 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 bureaucrats right there's something that kind of like constrains that from taking place um i had questions i had a simple question for you which was to ask in terms of the the you mentioned quite a bit uh, like in your paper on the PCC's just transition framework. And I was wondering if you saw that as a decolonial document um, uh, at all. Um, I had a question for you, but I think I should take it to the floor and then I'll get back to you because I feel like I'm crowding. We don't have much space, time. Um, thanks, Basani, for for your question and and your input in sort of gearing this this discussion. Um, from my perspective, um, being cognizant of where South Africa is in the current context is important. The just energy transition and the just transition is is occurring in the country and in a context that is already unjust and already unequal. So when we're talking about a just energy transition, we shouldn't just be thinking about, oh no, we need to create jobs in, in the renewable energy space, or we need to be creating green jobs, but we also need to make sure that those jobs are meaningful and decent. And in however way with, with collaboration with private sector, the state, other NGOs, there should be a, a, a sort of pause to, to look back and say, within the transition itself, how best do we then still address those inequalities? And how do we address the elephant in the room, which is the high unemployment in the country? So with, with renewable energy, it's, 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 it also has its issues in terms of land use capacity and all of these issues. But at the core of the transition itself, we need to ensure that we involve communities throughout the whole process. And, and, and Julia made uh, a very important point on how important it was within the Atlantis um, project, building trust with communities, because we can go to communities and, and workshop until the sun goes down. But if we can't build trust within those communities, then 
we don't have their, their buy-in and we can't then ensure that they don't resist whatever transition, or whatever projects we try to introduce. Um, thank you so much for that question. Um, I think my response to your question is a bit of a yes and a, a big of a, a big no. And the reason I I'm yeah, I have a bit of a yes and a no is um the PCC has tried so much or they've tried their best in capturing the whole notion of participation. They have tried so much to include coal uh, affected and dependent communities in their dialogues and in their many other uh, platforms that they've made available for these communities to participate. But um, I'm going to respond by posing a question to you or the audience. Okay. <laughs> but does the participation by the PCC capture the nuances of the, ex of the exclusion that communities actually suffer? You know, because there is a difference between inclusion that whereby people feel like they're included and a rhetoric inclusion whereby people are actually excluded by the included, you know, because inclusion should capture the essence of what these people are actually struggling with. It would capture the philosophies of these people, you know, the deep dynamics that are entrenched in the realities of these people. So they just, um, the PCC have, they've, they've, they've facilitated their dialogues in invited spaces, you know, with multi, um, multi actors, powerful multi actors, and in such spaces, communities are rendered voiceless because how do you compete with ESCO? You know, so it's 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 a bit of a yes and a no because there are nuances which I believe the PCC has not yet captured. However, I believe they are on the right path if they can listen to some of the the issues that the communities themselves have raised throughout the dialogues and the engagements. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for that. Are there any questions from the floor? Hi, um, this is Sartha from India. Um, so my question is open to the dais and any of the speakers can take it up. Um, in, in the context of energy transition and particularly uh, for the purpose of rehab, rehabilitating the conventional workforce into um, the alternative uh, greener avenues, um, do you think an uh, incremental approach would suffice or do we need a predetermined approach with a, a sort of a blanket coverage and predetermined milestones and uh, ultimately a final uh, ideal situation where do we want to reach a clear sight of that? So uh, in, in, in plain words, would, would an incremental approach uh, be more beneficial or a one which uh, is, you know, which looks down say five or 10 years down the lane? pre-planned and pre-designed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I think from all the presentations throughout the day, even though it is uh, mentioned here and there, I think it, this whole thing, it lacks the pronounced institutional architecture for this just transition, because that is the way we would have, uh, we stipulate our institutional arrangements for each institution. Otherwise, you would see what was happening in the video. That is why we keep on having throwing stones to each other because we don't have that institutional architecture that foregrounded this tran just transition. I even had the DG earlier on talking about the the, 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 the just uh, transition framework that needs now the action plan and so forth. But if we don't have this institutional architecture, we're still gonna grapple around this whole thing. And you remember in the SONA 2007 by Tabumbek, he was talking about greening the country, greening the, green the economy and so forth, meaning that we've been having this conversation for quite some time but we are still grappling with the solutions on how do we come out of this uh, problem that it, 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 it is now on our face, is no longer playing with us, is also destroying the environment and all the other problems that comes with the issues that uh, is, is, is with the climate change and so forth. Thank you. Thank you very much. A uh, quick one. Um, so I've, I'm wondering, let's say we, close down all the coal mines today. Do we think that we'll be achieving climate justice? Do we think we'll be achieving environmental justice? Do we think that the environmental outcomes would have improved? 
if we can't have that conversation and probably we can't start like considering um, that sort of conversation. And I'm not particularly sure that we are tackling the real issues. Coming off from the COP26, we sort of got a sense that there was a global consensus towards just transition and towards how to achieve just transition. The Russian-Ukraine conflict has exposed the hypocrisy in the international community, right? Um, and I'm wondering if developing countries shouldn't be considering that 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 hypocritical perspective and possibly taking in, into consideration the context in which they are discussing just transition. And if that matters at all in, 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 in this entire conversation around just transition. Thank you very much. I'm gonna close for now and ask that Julia, if you can maybe respond to the first question around um, incremental approach. Should we have an incremental approach versus a pre-planned long-term kind of approach to this question of just transition? So I took down part of that question as well as kind of approach to rehabilitating the conventional workforce, which made me think about the skills development programs that are running as part of this Atlanta special economic program uh, zone that I touched on. Given that Atlantis is this old apartheid created industrial area, a lot of the community has what they call legacy skills. They have skills in various manufacturing and industry. Um, and some people are still working or rotating between factories there. But now with the plan to attract green technology and the program to upskill, there's been this tension running about how, how incremental um, or how much can you plan or how do you rehabilitate the workforce in your words in the sense that because green technology is always changing and updating and because in the case of the special economic zone but in more broadly you're trying to attract investment often from outside the country or even from within the country you don't know exactly what the skills are that they need right now so you could give them uh, solar panel installation and maintenance skills and specific skills on some chemical, algal, biotech, whatever, but then that investor or that technology doesn't ever land. And then they have these skills and this hope and this expectation that comes to nothing, which is unfair as well and problematic. So you have, so what the approach that the ASCZ has taken is kind of broad, low level skills that can then be topped up when an investor lands or when a particular technology comes to fruition in that place. So I don't think it's the kind of thing that you can plan unless unless we had a state that was planning what the industrial structure exactly was going to take. And also, we, our state, we don't know what green technology is because it's in such a state of innovation to match the skills. I don't know. I think it's fairly a fairly impossible task, but they are kind of low level skills building, skills training that you can do to prepare for the green economy. But the open question of the green economy um, still makes that difficult. Thank you very much. I mean, that was the one question we got, the rest were comments, and I'm not sure if you'd wanna comment on institutional arrangements and, uh, you know, is this just transition? Does it fit our context given that we are a developing country? Um, in response to that question, actually, um, the scholarship that Explore have explored it, whereby they argue uh, what looks like a political economic context, you know, and these scholars are um, exploring this in the context of Nigeria being a rentier state and the complexity that would undergird a just tran a transition. I can't say just transition because I don't know if it's just a transition whereby the vested interest of the politicians actually are at the forefront of the actual transition itself. So because of that, they, you, we see a lot of inconsistencies and inadequacies that actually dominate the what you said um, at the architect, the architecture, but actually it's 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 undergirded by a lot of interests, you know, that are based on who stands to win and who stands to lose in the just transition. I don't know if Lerato wants to. Yeah, I just wanted to um, just add to the question that's being asked right now. Um, I was asked if if the power stations and the and the coal mines closed down um, would be achieve um, climate justice. 
we would achieve a, a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. We wouldn't achieve a, 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 a climate um, justice. I think it's also important to to contextualize the just transition within within the local context and um, to look at it from a lens that irrespective of whether it's just or not, the transition is happening. And it's on us, the onus is on us um, to make sure that it's just. Do we have the power though? Okay. <laughs> okay, I'm just, I just want to add on um, what Lerato was responding to. Um, one of the things that have been argued um, within the decolonial lens is the question of equity. You know, to say, how do we argue equity amid the great inequalities? Because then you cannot, the uh, you cannot impose a blank a blanket approach on South Africa and other neighboring countries, whereby we are on a trajectory of development, and this has also been argued by by African scholars to say. You don't just argue equity without understanding the dynamics that underpin the deep inequalities that constitute our nation. So, so um, one of the scholars have actually suggested different shades of green. Then, you know, to try and cater for the trade-offs that are happen that would happen or that would okay as part of the just transition or the greening of the economy. Thank you. Thank you. And on that note. <laughs> I would like to close the session. I think thank you very much to our presenters uh, for really great contributions and to the rest of you for your input. I guess we'll see you tomorrow, um, bright and early. Uh, enjoy the cocktail party. <laughs>